that amorphous <laughs> and uh, Thank you. open it topic. Thank you. It has been good for me to be with you all. I've always appreciated this congregation since I first became acquainted with you. I always feel very much at home with you. And uh, trust that uh, the Lord has blessed us in this time together. In talking about the church, I thought I would uh, read just a couple of verses as sort of a background passage. In 1 Timothy 3, the apostle gives the description of elders... Maybe I ought to read that since you are going to be electing elders next Sunday. Read that first part of it and then conclude with what he says about the church. Faithful is the saying. First, this is 1 Timothy 3 beginning with verse 1. Faithful is the saying, if a man seeketh the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. The word elder describes the office on the basis of the man's being older and that idea of his, his uh, uh, superiority in, the, in that sense of having gained much wisdom in, in the, over the years. The uh, word bishop describes the function, overseer. And it's the same office. Uh, he that seeketh, um, if a man seeketh the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. The bishop, therefore, must be without reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, orderly, given to hospitality, apt to teach, no brawler, no striker, but gentle, not contentious, no lover of money, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. But if a man knoweth not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up, he, fail, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony from them that are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Deacons in like matter must be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Let these also be first be proved, then let them serve as deacons if they be blameless." Women, and apparently it's the wives of the deacons in particular in view at this point because in, it's in the middle of the qualifications of the deacon. Women, in like manner, must be grave, not slanderous, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling, and over, uh, ruling their children and their own houses well. For they that have served well as deacons gain to themselves a good standing, and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how men ought to behave themselves in the house of God. Now notice the titles he gives to the church. And he's talking about the church visible, which has these offices, uh, elders and deacons. How to behave thyself or themselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, and the pillar and the ground of the truth. And I'm going to end the reading there because this ends with his reference to the church itself. But the church, visible church, is spoken of as the house of God, and the church of the living God, and her task to be the pillar and the ground of the truth. She's to hold that truth for, for, forward to the world. And she's to maintain it. She's to be the ground of it and, and to, to preserve her orthodoxy and to maintain the truth in this world. So one of the things that I think we have as Presbyterians and Reformed people who hold essentially to the Bible as being God's word is a high view of the church as visible. In modern evangelicalism, particularly dispensationalism, has tended to talk about people being really members of the church invisible, and they sort of denigrate the church visible. And yet here's the apostle talking about the church visible, and it's a high view of this church, the house of, of God, the church of the living God, and she's the pillar and the ground of the truth. Now, we believe the PCA is a true branch of this church, having uh, come as she did from a former branch of the church. Let me just give a, just a very brief sketch. I know several of you have mentioned the last time I was here, talked about the history of Presbyterianism, and we can't go over that at any length. But in the 
American Presbyterianism in 1801, you have what was called the Plan of Union that was proposed between the Presbyterians and the Congregationalists. Uh, the, the first assembly was formed about the same time the, fir the first Congress and the Constitution was drawn for the, for the nation in 1789. And, uh, and here now, that decade or, or so later, you have a plan of union as they moved westward into Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, that country, that they were going to unite because they both were Calvinists, Congregationalists from New England, Presbyterians from New York and Pennsylvania and Virginia, uh, as they moved westward, would unite together. Now, the plan, that plan of union, the, the Congregationalists by this time were beginning to be looser than full, strict Calvinists. And so you have what is called New England theology or New School theology. Now, as they moved along in 1837, they split over this issue. The old school, which would be the stricter Presbyterians with the strict subscription to the standards, the new school embracing this new school thought, thought coming out of New England, looser subscription, and so forth. This, these two groups both split uh, the New School prior to the war between the states, between Northern New School and Southern New School, and, uh, and, and that was in 1858, and this, this group didn't split until 1861 after the war had gotten started, and they had hoped they might continue together. And you have a Northern Old School and a, and a Southern Old School. Essentially, the Southern Presbyterian Church from which the major line of the PCA came would be Southern Old School. These two groups joined, excuse me, the, uh, the, new, the, the Southern New School and the Southern Old School jo joined during the time of the war. And they joined basically on the terms we're going to pr propagate and continue to be the Old School Presbyterian Church. In the North, the unions took place in 1869 and the result was that you had a, school, a church in which both viewpoints were allowed old Princeton seminary held the old school view all the other seminaries taught both views and ultimately they, they became new school and so what you have is a moving of, a, of two different groups in the Northern Presbyterian Church in the 1890s they put out of, out of the ministry a man ch named Charles Augustus Briggs who was teaching at Union Seminary in New York, which was then a Presbyterian school. They put him out of the ministry. That seminary decided, well, the thing for us to do is we'll just break from the church and keep him as a professor. That's exactly what they did. So the Union Seminary in New York became, in a sense, the seedbed of new school thought of, and eventually of liberal theology. And by 1910... With regard to the matter of subscription, they were affirming, whereas old school were saying strict subscription, all the doctrines of the confession. 1910 in the northern church, they had come to the five fundamentals as being what was required. They had lost the strict subscription. And that's frankly what I'm afraid we're going to see in the PCA as we have loosened our subscription vow and I've maintained all along that the Southern Church, uh, when they, it was proposed that they merge with this, with this Northern Old School, New School merger, they said, no, we're an Old School Church and you've abandoned the Old School faith. So the Southern, Southern Church was self-consciously Old School, strict subscription. And it's my p position, and uh, it's been voted down now by the Assembly, but it was my position that the, that the PCA, when it formed, wanted to be a continuing old school church, a continuing historic Southern Presbyterian church, not as it became liberal, but a continuing church that was maintaining the strict subscription and so forth. And what I fear, frankly, with regard to the subscription issue, and I put a protest on the floor of the assembly, and Henry says he signed that protest as well, that when they loosened it and said we are going to be a loose subscription and, and hold only the system of doctrine required, uh, 
I, I maintain that we are in the, on the skids, really. In the Northern Church, they officially did this in 1927. And in 1936, you have the split of the OP people out. In the, Nor in the Southern Church, they followed this Northern Church in the 1930s, uh, saying the same sort of thing. Then they, they sort of backed off from it. But they were moving in the same direction. And eventually, the, the Southern Church, uh, not as openly as the Northern Church, moved into liberalism. But they gradually moved, after World War II, into liberalism. And that's why we finally said we had to leave her in 1973. And uh, so uh, what I am fearful of, frankly, from one who holds to the, to the strict subscription position, is that uh, the PCA is going to begin to say, and what, what both the Northern Church and the Southern Church said in their subscription statements, it's left up to the presbyteries to decide what exceptions they will allow. Now, what you see even now in the PCA is a presbytery, for example, on the creation issue. Westminster Presbytery in East Tennessee and Southwest Virginia has said, we won't allow any minister come into this presbytery who doesn't believe in six literal day creation. Don't even apply. And uh, whereas other presbyteries say, oh, we don't hold that standard at all. And so we already have divergent standards with regard to the matter of creation. And I think that can begin to happen on other issues. You may well begin to see some, some presbyteries beginning to say, we believe that women ought to be deaconesses in the church. And, and a man that holds that view, that's acceptable to us. And he may teach that view in this presbytery. And you begin, the presbytery begins to move in that direction of, of having women officers in the church. And other presbyteries saying, oh, absolutely not. And I, I fear that ultimately we may see division of the PCA because of this loosening of the subscription view uh, that took place what, about three assemblies ago, wasn't it? Now, happily, at that assembly that it took place, there was the issue that was brought up. Southern Florida Presbytery had allowed a man to come in that, who said he wasn't sure of what the Western Church has always held, that the Holy Spirit proceeds both from the Father and from the Son. The language of the, of the Gospel of John is that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. The Western Church took the position by good and necessary consequence, if since he has the same relation to the Father and to the Son, he must also proceed from the Son. And so they added that phrase uh, in, 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 to their creed. The Eastern Orthodox Church, Greek, Greek Orthodox or Russian Orthodox, do not hold to that. Here was a man in southern Florida Presbytery who said, I'm not sure that I believe the Holy Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son. The assembly said to Florida Presby southern Florida Presbytery, you go back and look at this. Happily, the next year, when it came to the floor of the assembly, they, they reported, this man has repented of that view the Presbytery does insist that he hold to that full statement which was in our confessional standards. And so we didn't see that divergence. Potentially, Southern Florida could have said, it's none of your business, Assembly. We've approved him with that as an exception, and we have the authority to do so now. And I don't think we could have done anything about it as an Assembly. And, uh, but as, so far, at least... The most serious case of di doctrinal di divergence of that sort uh, has not taken place and or has not been approved by a presbytery or by the assembly. And so we haven't seen that. But I think we're going to see it. Uh, your pastor indicates sometimes men come to this presbytery with various exceptions that seem to be allowed by the presbytery that other presbyteries wouldn't allow. That the, there's probably already that thing is growing out there. There's some 60 presbyteries. Who knows what's going on in all those different 60 presbyteries. But some presbyteries will be looser, some stricter. In my own presbytery so far, I'm on the examining committee, and the chairman of our committee, two different chairmen have served since that action was taken, and they have said, now, this action says man must declare his exceptions. And so we've had a clearer more open declaration of exceptions to the standards uh, than we had before. And I'm glad for that. That's one of the good things that's come out of this, this, this language that was adopted by the assembly. 
But uh, if you get a presbytery that's looser, they may say, well, Ed, you don't have to declare them. And uh, in fact, that was said on the floor of the assembly by one of the leaders of the assembly. If you don't declare it, it won't get it questioned. And uh, so that, that's, that I see, see as a potential danger as far as doctrine and theology in the church is concerned. Let me say, with regard to exceptions, when I, and the, the man doesn't decide whether he has an exception. He says, I, I differ with the confession on these three or four points. And the committee and the presbytery may say, that's really not an exception. You're just talking about grammatical structure or something of that sort. And we don't, do not judge that to be a doctrinal exception at all. Other cases, they may say, it is an exception. We had a man, for example, that came to our presbytery at the last meeting. And he said he believed in pedo communion, part of this thing that the Auburn Avenue people are holding to, the idea that infants may, may be receiving the communion. And uh, we declared that to be an exception. Now, our motion after that, and I think Presbyterians ought not to say this exception is acceptable to us, but rather to say this, we believe that despite his error, because that's what we're saying, we believe on the basis of our standards that he's in error on that doctrine, but despite that error, his ministry will not be made, uh, affected in a major way. Now, we may at that point say to him, and you may not teach it, uh, and so uh, that, by the way, the assembly has acted on a couple of times very strongly to the effect that the, uh, that the assembly has that right. Some people say, oh, you're infringing on his conscience. Well, if he can't live with that, then he ought not to come into that presbytery. But the, the, pre the presbytery has the right to say, you hold a view contrary to our standards. We do not want that view taught that could upset our church. And so that is legitimate, and the assembly has on several occasions approved that, that sort of position. There was a man in Williamsburg, Virginia, that wanted to say, well, he was charismatic in his approach to worship. He wanted to be allowed to say, I have a word from the Lord, and lead worship that way. And the presbytery said, no, absolutely not. He complained that you're infringing on my conscience. And the assembly said they had every right to, and in fact, they have the duty to protect their people from what they judged to be an error. So that, that we judge is, is the case. Uh, and one other thing I would say is you're having new elders come. Ultimately, I don't think, despite the bad statement that they adopted with regard to the, the uh, subscription, they didn't change the subscription vow. I judge it to still be a strict statement because this is what the vow says. Do you receive and adopt the confession and catechisms of this church? Do you receive and adopt what? The system of doctrine? No. Do you receive and adopt the confession and catechisms? That's what you're adopting. And as containing the system of doctrine. And uh, John Murray at Westminster Seminary uh, said that's the, the vow. Is that you're adopting the confession and catechisms. You're not adopting the system of doctrine. Despite the language that's been put into the book about system of doctrine now. Trouble with system of doctrine approach, you can say, well, what is the system? Well, I believe it's Calvinism. That's where most people are in the PCA at this point. But some might say, it's those five fundamentals. That's all that's required in the system. The Northern Church got to that point in 1910, again, reaffirmed it in 1923, and then you have the Auburn Affirmation, in which men said, we think those are nice five points, but they're not required for ministers to believe. And the people became unbelievers who were in the ministry. Uh, and so you had the, the terrible decline of the northern church after that point. But uh, that's, I think, the major thing that we face, uh, or have faced in, in the PCA. Let me say also about some other things, though. There is something that is being proposed to us uh, uh, from the basis of a major study committee that's been out there for about three or four years. And they're proposing a, a, a major shake-up of the assembly. And I think we'll lose Presbyterianism at the, at the assembly level if they adopt it. Uh, one thing, the old Southern Church had this, and uh, then so as a stated clerk, I just wrote it into the rules, and it was adopted by our church as well, that as the, as, as the General Assembly meets, 
perhaps I diagram this as the General Assembly meets that the business that comes to that assembly must go to an assembly's committee. We call that committee a committee of commissioners. That is, committee made up of the commissioners of that assembly. So here's a business coming, an overture. It goes to the assembly's committee of commissioners, say, is dealing with foreign missions. And that committee of commissioners then brings it to the floor of the assembly after they've studied it. And they say, we recommend the approval of this overture, or we recommend the non-approval. Now, the report of the, of the Mission to the World Committee comes to that assembly committee. They go over that, that report, and they report that to the floor. That means that these permanent structures are not running the church so much, but rather the assembly is running it. Now, this new, uh, age, new group that's come in with this proposal are saying, well, that was in reaction to the liberalism of the old church that the, we adopted such a position as this. It wasn't so at all. That was the old position of the southern church. I went to assemblies, served on their standing committees, as they called them, and we received all the business. No business came to the floor of the assembly that didn't go through that committee. In each, and you have a number of these different committees, Committee on Foreign Missions and Home Missions and Church and Christian Education and Covenant Seminary and Covenant College and so forth. And all the business goes through a committee of commissioners who ass assess what these reports are. They're members of the assembly itself assessing it. And then they come back and say to the assembly, we think you ought to adopt this. We think you ought not to adopt this. And, and I think that it would be wrong. What they're, what they're proposing now is that MTW report to the, straight to the floor and that this committee can recommend regarding that. But it won't, it won't have to go through that committee. This is something of almost a watchdog. If, a, if a, an agency is not doing what it's been told to do, this committee will tell the assembly they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And it has occurred on occasion that they've said they didn't follow what the guideline was that was given to them. And the assembly then, and then they make a motion to the effect to direct this mission, a mission to the world to do such and such, or direct co covenant college or covenant seminary or whatever it may be to do such and such in accord with the di previous direction of the assembly. So I think that this is far better structure. The other thing that they are proposing is that we begin to have a super committee for bills and overtures. Right now, with the major businesses that are coming to the assembly outside of just the ordinary agency businesses, such as Mission to the World, Mission to the, to the uh, North America, and so forth, major businesses are being proposed by presbyteries are coming up by bills and overtures from each presbytery. And uh, this major bills and overtures committee then makes its reports as to whether you want to adopt this or not adopt it. They're proposing that we set up a, a committee that will have, I think, two men from each presbytery sitting on it. And that means a, a committee, if we have 60 presbyteries, that's going to be a, a mammoth-sized committee. That they will debate it, and they will discuss it, and then it, the assembly has to take whatever they debate. The, you've lost Presbyterianism there. The answer to it, in my mind, and it's one of the errors that we made in 1973 was that when we set up our, our assembly, what you have in the Presbyterian polity is a, a situation. Here we have a session. Who, who makes up the session? The teaching elder, or if there are more than one, of the congregation, and the ruling elders of the congregation. What makes up the presbytery? The teaching elders and ruling elders of the congregations of that area who make up the General Assembly. Teaching elders and ruling elders of the whole church. Now, what we have said in making up the assembly structure, that every teaching elder can go be a member of the assembly, not just representatives of this presbytery, but every teaching elder can go. And every church can send two ruling elders now and most churches don't have enough, or let least country churches don't have enough to send one. The result is we're getting a general assembly that is tough, heavy with teaching elders. And that's dangerous. As a teaching elder, I'll say that's dangerous. We are two, sometimes three to one. 
How many ruling elders, teaching elders as compared to the ruling elders? Ruling elders are not having their part. If you do as the PCUS and the PCUSA, or now they've merged into just one church, do what they did, and I think this would be preferable, that here we're going to have every presbytery represented at the assembly with, say, uh, three plus three of each kind. It, it depends on maybe the size of the presbyteries. But a representative assembly made up of representatives of the 60 presbyteries. Now, the OPC, if you, if you go to an OPC assembly, I ask men, what's the difference when you go to PCA assembly and OPC assembly? The OPC assembly dis- debates and discusses things. And you know about how large that church, the assemblies are? Maybe 150? They've got time to sit down and debate and to hear from everybody that wants to speak. We've got 1,500 members as an assembly we have time, at the maximum on a, on a debate, five minutes. And if you had run out of the five minutes, shall the assembly extend by another five minutes? And, and we are so limited on how much debate, we really don't get much substantive debate. You simply can't. It's a convention, not an, a delegated assembly. And I think the solution to this thing is not to abandon Presbyterianism, which is what we would be doing if we adopt the stuff that's being proposed for this, at this next assembly on restructuring the assembly. The solution is to go to representative assembly and say a maximum of, well, Congress, 450. I'm sure, I think that's a heavy and that's a little large. 250 would be better. And that the clerk's office then assigns to each presbytery how many it's going to make up to get that 250. And then... And Jack Williamson and I, who stood on different, issue, different sides on some of the issues, proposed this years ago when I was still clerk. You know what the problem is? Assembly is made up of teaching elders. Twice as many teaching elders as the ruling elders. Those teaching elders like to go to the assembly, take their families, and you'll notice how much stuff in, that comes out about the assembly is about all the recreation that's around here. And the families come to go and have vacation. The, the teaching elders simply will not vote themselves out of that week of vacation. <laughs> he, will vote for, he will vote himself out of it. And, and I, if the way in which we could get this thing to work would be what the U.S. church used to do, and I think now the USA church does. You have, and this is a, uh, uh, an absolute verboten to talk about this, of a head tax that every that is the assembly assesses every congregation uh, so much from every congregation and that that pays for those to come you look at the records of the USA assembly they'll have almost equal number of teaching and ruling elders when you get elected to go to the general assembly of the USA church it's an honor and you have a system there. Generally, you have uh, so many n- nominees, say four people coming from each presbytery, and then you'd have alternates. In other words, we'd elect two or, two or four teaching elders as principals, and then if they can't go, there's an alternate that's going to go, and these men will make their time and get there. And one of the problems we have now is everybody has to pay his own way, or the churches have to pay the way of the ministers. Teaching elders usually falls on them just to pay their own way. If we had this concept of, of the, of the uh, tax of every congregation and the assembly had the funds and say, okay, they were going to have to pay for 250 people and we're not going to go to these big convention centers. We're not going to have to rent those. We're going to be able to come to a church maybe a little larger than this church and you can meet in smaller towns, smaller cities and meet in more economical situations. The, t- the cost of an assembly is really prohibitive now. They're charging, what are they charging now, 250 or $300? $400 next year. That's a, a registration fee. They're making us pay $400. And what's that mainly for? Renting of those rooms and renting of all those facilities and all of that. We simply don't need these elaborate conventions that we've gotten into. But rather can have a small assembly and have much better debate I can remember when I went to the OPC assembly for their joining and receiving. We started on Monday morning. They had started it on Saturday afternoon, and then they recessed. And they debated whether they were going to join the PCA. They debated all day long. 
And because Machen had been mistreated by moving the previous question, they would not accept that motion. A minister made that motion. A new, newcomer to the OPC made that motion. Moved the previous question right after supper. They voted it down. Fifteen minutes later, moderator said, I don't see anybody asking for the floor. If there's no objection, I'm going to put the question. But they, they are so sensitive about people abusing the, the, the parliamentary procedures in order to gain their victories that they, they simply, it's, a written, it's an unwritten rule. They just don't have that motion that they allow to the floor, really. Move the previous question. They allow it, but they won't ever vote it to cut off, off debate. And so they waited until everybody had had his word. And I'd been there all day, and then most of them had had the word two or three times. <laughs> but the beauty of that system is that they all expressed themselves. They, they got it out of, of their ch off their chest, as it were. They were able to debate. I was standing on this matter of subscription, for example, at a microphone, three people ahead of me. When the debate ended, the vote of the assembly said, no, we won't extend the time. Here were, many of us were waiting to want to speak to this thing. And we were just cut off. And so uh, th this would be, in my mind, the solution to this dilemma that we've gotten into, these high-cost assemblies, and also non-debating non assemblies, and then setting up this special uh, committee on, on bills and overtures that does all the debating and not the assembly itself. Uh, I think that's, that's just a loss of true Presbyterianism. Now, let me say one other thing about what kind of a church I would like to have seen that we didn't develop. I think the Southern Church had developed Presbyterianism in some ways better than most Presbyterian churches elsewhere, the Northern and Scottish and so forth. The Southern Church had, for example, the home mission program was, is, was to be operated this way, that the Presbyteries controlled it. Now, granted, when you all first came into the PCA, there wasn't a Presbytery here, and so the assembly needed to come out and sent Larry Mills out and to help you get started. But once you got a Presbytery, it shouldn't have been Atlanta sending in missionaries to here until you ask for them. I can remember, I was a member of Central Mississippi Presbytery of the old church. And we said one year to the, to the uh, agency or the, the committee on, on uh, 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 home missions, we said, we want to start five new churches in, in Central Mississippi Presbytery. And we need so much money for that. They, uh, they, they looked at it and said, we don't have that much money. We can give you three. Enough for three missions. But who, why, where were those missions to be established? Atlanta didn't settle it. It was settled by us in Mississippi. Now, one of the most successful presbytery situations that has occurred in the PCA was in South Carolina. At first, there was one presbytery covered the whole state. And Larry Mills and the, and the MUS people, as they were called at that time, offered, well, what can we do? You just leave us alone, give us help if we need financially. But that presbytery has grown and doubled, split, split again, uh, because they operate their home missions from home. And they control it entirely at home. Whereas I think there's been far too much control and attempt to control situations from Atlanta itself. And that can be abused. Uh, sometimes people have been pressured about what way they vote if they're getting home mission money from the assembly. And that's just wrong. And so I, th I think we would have been better off if we had followed the Southern Presbyterian pattern. And I don't think that the young, some of the young men that set up the U.S. at that time really were aware of that pattern or really thought it through. The same is true of mission to the world. What happened at the First Assembly is that uh, Presbyterian Evangelistic Fellowship had an overseas arm called ECHO, and they gave their 20 missionaries to the PCA. And in doing so, they gave their method of support, which was a parachurch approach to missions. Now, the old Southern Church, you didn't have to, a missionary didn't have to go out and raise his own support. The, 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 what you had would be the mission in Korea, send to Nashville and ask, we need five more missionaries this next year. And, and the Mission to the World Committee would get out and, and stir around and say, we've got the opportunity of sending five new missionaries to Korea if we can get the support. And that was spread across the church. And when the support came in, 
Then they were able to call the five missionaries and commission them and send them out. And so uh, we, what we did, we adopted a parachurch approach to missions. And it's a typical American par pragmatic approach. It works. Why not use it? But it wasn't Presbyterian. And we never, we never I don't think we're going to break from it because it does work. But the missionaries hate it. They come home, and I remember hearing of one missionary came home and, and the car agency let him have a car for a lease for the year. And you know, when he got back that car back, 100,000 miles on it. And, and his traveling continuously all year long. He had put 100,000 miles on that car. And, and in Korea, when we had a mission in Korea, that's been closed down now because Korea's got so many churches of its own. But they told me when I was over there that when a missionary comes back from his leave of absence, they give him another month to go on vacation to get, re to get rested up from being in America. <laughs> that, they, they literally recognized that as a problem, that missionaries came back exhausted from having their, their supposed term off, a year off from their labors, and, and just rushing around trying to raise funds. And where it's far better if the church says, we will send you if the church will support us. And, if, and when they got the support in, then they would call the missionaries and send them. Uh, then the other thing that the Southern Church did that I wish we could develop, and I've talked to Dr. Koyster about this, and I, he says he's moving in that direction, but I'm not sure how fast. We presently operate our mission agency pretty much as a business agency. Atlanta controls, you got a, a director for Europe and a director for Africa and so forth, and he tells them what to do. In the southern form of the way this thing was developed, the mission in Korea, for example, determined what their needs were for this year. They let Nashville know. And further than that, when a man had been out there for a year, five years and then came home and they was ready to come back, they were asked, do you want him back? That mission in Korea determined, not Nashville, determined who came back. And by, in that way, they were acting like a presbytery, saying, this is what our needs are, this is what we want, and we do not want this liberal missionary that you sent to us last time. Don't send him back to us. And uh, they guarded, uh, Korea and Japan both guarded their, their missions quite, quite strongly by that very method. And I, again, as I say, that is one of the things I wish we could revamp in the PCA. Now, having spoken about some of the things that are negative, and I realize I'm running over time, let me say, I think the PCA has a lot of good things going for it. Good churches being founded. When I went through seminary in the Southern Church in 1951, there was but one Calvinist in the four theological seminaries that was serving uh, the Southern Church. One Calvinist in, on the faculty. Look at us now. We've got all sorts of faculties with Calvinists teaching Calvinism and our ministers by and large embrace Calvinism and the Reformed faith. And we thought it had died. And, uh, and, and under the grace of God we see Reformed seminaries. I don't know how many branches they have now, but three major branches and, maybe, and so, several others, something in Atlanta and something in Washington and uh, Henry Selling, so a couple of others that I hadn't even heard of. Uh, Knox Seminary or, Cal, Cal, or, 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 or Covenant Seminary, the denomination's own seminary, but the others of us are approved by agencies. Greenville Seminary, uh, Westminster Seminary with its several branches, uh, that's something that's just multiplied. What is the Lord doing? Is he preparing for some great awakening down the way? We have more ministers than we have churches. Ministers have difficulty in moving because they, there's a surplus of ministers. And uh, is God raising up a group that will eventually serve uh, an expanding church? I hope so. So that's one of the things. I think our work with, with university students is one of the best things that's going on in the PCA. Uh, they're just fine. They were what they're doing with the university students far better than Campus Crusade or InterVarsity. And I was a product of InterVarsity at the University of Michigan, and it was very helpful to me. But how much more helpful if my church had had uh, an agency there helping me be, to be related to my church. And as I went back into life of, from the university to go back with some knowledge about how to be a churchman and so forth and 
our, the Reformed University Ministries is doing a fine job. And I think our mission work is, is doing a base, basically a good job in many places. I could wish it could be stronger in some places, in some ways, but I think we, have, we are a mission church. And that's one of the reasons the Lord has blessed us, I think. So there are many good things about the PCA. Let's just pray that we can keep her and make her better. But we do be, need to be very seriously on guard lest we let her slip in any way. Now, I don't know how much time you want to take for any questions, or, or we are over time. Five more minutes. Are there, are there questions, pointed questions that some of you would want to raise in the next five minutes? Yes, sir. And I don't know. I just really don't know. I'm not that acquainted with it. And uh, how significant it is, that kind of thing can become very significant. Uh, and, uh, but I don't know the specifics of your question. So I just admit that. Sorry. Yes, sir. You mentioned about having this representative system might be better for uh, General Assembly. And I was just curious in terms of you know, the current PCUSA has that now. Mm -hmm. It's really not gone the best direction. And I was also curious, could such a system like that be taken advantage of by saying appointing only people that one certain side or faction wants to be represented? It, 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 yes. it can be misused. The question is whether, whether this idea of the representative assembly and so forth that I've suggested would be really good for us, and is that really, uh, after all, the USA church has drifted into liberalism uh, with that system, and they can, it can be controlled. Now, we in Mississippi, when the southern church, we were in the throes of it, we always sent nothing but conservatives. Uh, Dr. Robert Strong from Alabama went every year to the assembly, and he was a conservative leader, and Jack Williamson went every year to the assembly. So the presbytery had that prerogative of sending their best men and, of course, the liberal presbytery sent their best men. But, uh, and, and if you get a church that is dominated by the liberals, then they will be able to take it over. But I don't think it was that system, the representative system, uh, that ruined it, the southern church or the northern church, either one. I don't think that was the thing that they took control of. They contr took control of the educational institutions. They got the seminaries. They got the literature materials. And uh, that's how, how they gained in the southern church, how they gained the control of a conservative church up to the beginning of the, 1920 or so. It was very conservative. And Trice Thompson, who was a liberal, wrote there, and when he, he retired at about 50 years of teaching, they said there were five things that he had changed in the PCUS. One was the view of inerrancy of Scripture. He had just simply taught so many men that you don't have to hold to this. And then the, the rotating elder system. He said you, the permanent elder system means you can't introduce new ideas. You just get a rotating elder system. And he broke, broke that system in the Southern Church. Uh, by the way, in that connection, just as, as an aside, Legan Duncan at First Church in Jackson, that session is often stronger than the minister. Theologically stronger than the minister because they have a permanent elder system. Uh, and so... Uh, Dr. Thompson, though, did, did see that kind of change. And there were other things that he stood against and were able to, he was able to change. But he admits in his book on, on the Southern Church, it was a changing of the elder system that was enabling them to take over these conservative little country churches and make them into liberal voices. And he admitted that very thing. So it wasn't the system itself. It was those who were willing to, to come in and, and abuse it, really. But yes, I don't think that a system is going to save us. You always have to be on your, on your uh, uh, vigil and, and be careful that you're not letting error come in. Yes, sir. I think it sometimes is happening. Uh, I think the Dallas folks uh, have sort of an, uh, a, an extra organization that is not owned by the presbytery, but is owned in a sense by some of the large churches who are then planting their, their kind of churches around in the, in the presbytery. And I think the presbytery simply has to, has to draw the lines and say, 
if a new church is going to be started in our bounds, it's got to at least come through the, through the committee on, on the expansion, the mission to the to North America Committee. Well, I think our time is up. Uh, I appreciate, again, the privilege of being with you. Trust this has been of some use, and uh, I, I trust that the Lord will, will guide us all in how to conduct ourselves in the church down in the future. Uh, let's close with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the church of the Lord Jesus. We thank Thee for the PCA and for the way in which she has stood for the faith in many, many ways. And we confess, O oh Lord, that as she's erred, that we've been guilty in part with regard to that. We pray that Thou would guard us against, against ourselves and against men who would seek in any way to abuse the privileges that they have within the church. Bless us now as we're dismissed. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.